So hello and welcome to Sears webinar series on net zero by 2030, fact or fiction. Today we are putting the spotlight on aviation on um, a series entitled Aviation Delivering Net Zero. After yesterday's event on sustainable garden communities and Monday's on transport policy and strategy. So my name is Clémence Routaboul, I'm an associate director at STEER and I'll be your host today. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, please note that this session is recorded. Um, and also, please feel free to send any questions you have um, in the chat function of um, uh, your app. Um, please, when you do so, can you please provide your company name and your name? And um, there will be a Q&A session um, after Matt's presentation, where we'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible. So um, let's now start. Um, the clock is ticking on the Paris Agreement stretch target to limit global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius. Yet, on the eve of COP26, Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, declared that current shipping and aviation commitments are more consistent with warming way above three degrees. So to discuss aviation industry commitments, how and how fast we remove carbon from aviation, I am joined by Matt Gorman, Carbon Strategy Director at Heathrow Airport. Heathrow Airport is one of the world's first major airport hub to become carbon neutral for its infrastructure and the first to target zero carbon by mid-2030. So Matt, welcome and thank you very much for being here today. We look forward Brilliant. to hearing from you in a minute. Oh, hi Matt. Um, be, be, before we hear from you, I think, uh, let me introduce yourself to um, our attendees. Um, so you are Carbon Strategy Director for Heathrow in a newly formed function which has brought together the airport business strategy and sustainability areas into a new carbon and strategy department. For the last decade, you were a Sustainability and Environment Director at Heathrow, leading the team that developed Heathrow 2.0 the airport's award-winning leadership plan for sustainable growth. You played a key role in developing the new approach to expansion, which was backed by the Airports Commission and UK Parliament. You're also a council member and past chair of Sustainable Aviation, the coalition of UK airlines, aircraft and engine manufacturers and airports. You have represented the global airport industry in ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization's Working Group on Aviation and Climate Change and Heathrow on the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change. You're a trustee of the Hillingdon Community Trust, a past vice chair of CIRA, the Labour Environment Campaign, and a past trustee of Tourism Concern, which campaigns for ethical tourism, and of the Heathrow Community Fund. You have also co-authored a book on corporate responsibility called Big Business, Big Responsibilities, From Villains to Visionaries, How Companies Are Tackling the World's Greatest Challenge. And um, you're also fluent in Spanish and French, although I think today we are sticking to English. Yeah. Okay, so Matt, um, thank you for being here today. We're all ears. Um, the, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Uh, thanks, Clemence. Yeah, no, uh, it's probably more accurately written, once fluent in French and Spanish. I think I would struggle with some of the climate change vocabulary, probably. But uh, thanks for the invite here today. And um, thanks to those who are joining online. I've been asked to talk for about 15 minutes um, and I'm going to give an overview of both the aviation sector and our path to net zero and then a little bit about what Heathrow specifically is planning in this space. Um, and I suppose before I go on to my first slide, my starting point here is pretty simple that, uh, and it's something I believe passionately, that aviation is a force for good in the world. Um, and that's both e economically, um, connecting uh, businesses and uh, supporting livelihoods around the world. I think hundreds of millions, if you think of the tourist industry, uh, but not just economically, connecting friends and family around the world, connecting cultures. Um, and it's something I personally have benefited from through my life, living, working, studying in different parts of the world. Uh, many of those journeys actually beginning on a plane from Heathrow. Um, but we will only protect those benefits uh, for this century if we decarbonize. And that's the challenge ahead of us. We have to get to net zero by 2050 uh, to protect those benefits. So if I go on to my first slide, actually, we can skip past the title slide and go to the next one. Um, 
we describe uh, climate change as an existential risk for aviation, and that's a big word and not one we've chosen lightly. Um, but we produce a detailed disclosure of our risks in line with something many of you, I think, will be familiar with, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure for Investors. Um, and the kind of uh, description we've given there of the risk is that unless aviation has a clear path to net zero uh, and is progressing against that, uh, our ability to grow as a sector, um, certainly in the UK, uh, and to thrive as a sector in future will be uh, challenged because we might face uh, government restrictions uh, on growth and operation as a sector. We might face changing consumer sentiment. Uh, we might face more difficulty or, or cost at borrowing money or attracting investment. So it's a significant risk. And, and by the way, it's not just those kind of policy and market risks, but it's also actually the physical impacts of climate change, probably less so on Heathrow directly, although there are some. Uh, but if you think of our core markets around the world um, and you, the risk to some key tourist destinations, you know, low lying islands, coastal cities, um, people won't fly to those destinations if they are uh, underwater. Um, uh, people, uh, and you can see some of the impacts on our core markets potentially being quite significant if we don't tackle climate change. So it's an existential challenge. If I go on to the next slide, though. Um, we as a sector have done uh, a lot of work on how we respond to this challenge. And the good news is we can take the carbon out of flying even as we grow. Now, what you're seeing on the slide is a um, uh, the work done by the UK aviation sector, a group called Sustainable Aviation that brings together airports, but also airlines, manufacturers in the UK, uh, which looks out to 2050 and says, what are the big things we would do to, to decarbonize? We actually published this at the beginning of last year, just before the pandemic. It was the first time anywhere in the world that a national aviation sector had set out a clear commitment to and pathway to net zero. So let me give you the three big chunks of this, which will be uh, important to frame some of the presentation. And, and I'll refer to them as I go through. The first big chunk is using less fuel. Uh, and you'll see the first on the list there is um, uh, some some reduced uh, demand from carbon pricing. We do see that having some uh, impact in the years ahead. Um, we'll also use less fuel through operational efficiencies, both on the ground, but particularly through modernizing airspace, the roads in the sky, skies above our head. Um, but the biggest chunk there is um, improved conventional aircraft. And we can predict pretty confidently because aircraft have got uh, up to 25 year lifetimes, the kind of aircraft entering the fleet now, how much more efficient they will be in the next generation. So those steps to use less fuel are brilliant. But if you look at the uh, difference they make, um, uh, do nothing emissions would rise significantly uh, by 2050. You can see over in the blue bar on the left. And those different steps to use less fuel would keep emissions about where they are today, uh, allowing for growth. So we need to do more to get to net zero. The two big steps available to us then are to change the plane or to change the fuel. Uh, so if I go on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about both of those. Thank you. Um, so changing the plane is really exciting. And there are, are some um, significant developments and investments underway here. And this is this is looking at moving to a zero emissions aircraft, uh, possibly pure electric for very short journeys, um, uh, but more likely uh, hydrogen aircraft for uh, longer journeys. So uh, your typical short haul journey in Europe. Um, could, could be commercial in 10 to 15 years. Airbus have set out a plan to introduce an aircraft that could fly uh, up to 2,000 nautical miles, up to 200 seats by the middle of the next decade. Um, that's, it's really exciting, as I say. The challenge is that probably, uh, we think, solves perhaps 30% of uh, aviation carbon by, by 2050, uh, if the, that technology was fully rolled out for those uh, route lengths. Uh, and obviously, there is a, there'll be a, a a timing issue to roll those new planes out uh, as well. So really important as the airport, we absolutely want to enable that technology and not be a blocker to it. So we're very focused on what the airport infrastructure needs are there. But our conclusion is we still need uh, another solution, particularly for long haul journeys, um, while some of this new technology is being rolled out and indeed as a backup if this new technology takes a little bit longer. And that's where changing the fuel comes in. So this is shifting to sustainable aviation fuels, uh, lower carbon fuels. Uh, they can save life cycle carbon by at least 70 percent, actually up to 100 percent with fully synthetic fuels in future. Um, 
proven today. They've flown, uh, I think, coming on for 400,000 flights around the world. Uh, typically, these are um, their advanced biofuels uh, that we're focused on, certainly in the UK, using different kinds of waste, municipal waste, uh, agricultural waste, even industrial waste gases uh, to make fuel. Um, the big advantage is they can be dropped into current air aircraft and pipelines, so you don't need to wait for that 25-year aircraft replacement cycle. As soon as you start producing SAF, you can start to decarbonize. Um, and, but the challenge is they cost more. So if I go on to the next uh, slide, um, the big challenge is uh, that these cost uh, two to four times at least, actually up to five times more uh, than kerosene. Um, so if you're an airline, you're going to be uh, reluctant to sign off to an offtake uh, agreement for such significant amounts of a fuel that is that much more expensive. Uh, and hence, if you're an investor, you're going to be uh, reluctant to invest in plants making it without that certainty of demand. So governments have a key role here. Um, and there's two really big things we need uh, government to do. Uh, the first is to uh, stimulate supply of this fuel with an escalating mandate, so a requirement on fuel producers to produce it. But we also need to stimulate demand with uh, a some kind of price incentive, a price support mechanism. And actually in the UK, we're focusing particularly on contracts for difference, uh, which lower the cost to the end purchaser of fuel. So provide that demand signal to stimulate investment. Alongside those two steps, there's also a role for capital support uh, and or loan guarantees, particularly for first, first of a kind plants. The good news is the government's beginning to move on this. Um, so it's already consulted on plans for a mandate, uh, further consultation planned early next year with legislation uh, by the end of next year. It announced in its net zero strategy uh, some significant capital funding, uh, 180 million for uh, first of a kind plants and actually Bill Gates has joint funded some of that as well through Breakthrough Ventures, so some significant uh, funding. The big thing we need to move on is this price support uh, mechanism. And if I go to the next slide, the case we're also making to the government is this isn't just a uh, decarbonisation opportunity, it's a huge economic opportunity, but it's one where the UK risks falling behind if we don't move quickly on these, these policies. So if you look across uh, Europe at the map on the screen, these are uh, announced plants uh, or planned plants in Europe, uh, so totalling about 25. Uh, there are three announced in the UK which would uh, provide about 6% uh, of uh, the fuel from all of the plants on the screen. But actually, the UK consumes about 20% of all jet fuel in Europe at the moment. We're a big aviation market, so you can see we're not uh, yet um, kind of matching uh, the size of our aviation market with our investment in or planned investment in SAF plants. If you looked at a map of the US, uh, you'd see a significant number of plants there, actually particularly as the US has introduced uh, what's called a blender's credit, uh, a tax incentive uh, for um, carriers to, uh, to, to buy sustainable fuel. So significant investment there. The UK needs to move quickly. Um, if I just go on to the next slide, the um, just as an aside, really, to, to make the point that these solutions exist, they just need to scale up. Um, BA uh, put sustainable fuel up to a 35% blend on all of its uh, flights between uh, London airports, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and actually, I think, Aberdeen, all of the Scottish airports uh, during the COP uh, process um, over the last couple of weeks. So a really strong signal uh, that this technology exists, we just need to scale it now. And actually EasyJet, I think, did the same on flights from Gatwick to Scotland as well. So if I go on to the next slide, um, we, uh, we ultimately need to decarbonize aviation uh, globally. Um, I'll talk, turn in a second to talk about Heathrow steps. I've talked about the UK industry pathway to net zero. Uh, but if the UK decarbonized alone, we'd still have a carbon problem globally. The good news here is uh, growing momentum. And I was talking to Clemence about this just before we came on the call. Um, I've worked uh, either campaigning about, advising or worked in the aviation sector for about 20 years now. Uh, and the sense of momentum we've seen in the last couple of years is palpably different for what, what we've seen before. And I think that's a uh, a recognition to the existential nature of the challenge that I described. I think we're seeing this more broadly, not just for aviation, as climate change becomes not something that uh, will happen in future, but something we can see happening now 
uh, as humans generally, we're increasingly focused on the risk. Um, so as an illustration of that, two years ago, International Airlines Group, the owner of BA, became the first airline to commit to net zero, first airline group. Uh, and within two years, the entire global sector, as of last month, has now committed to net zero. So a really clear commitment. We think that's the first time a whole global uh, industrial sector has done that. So the commitments there. Um, uh, globally, our industry bodies have published plans to get to net zero, strong emphasis on scaling up sustainable fuel and then introducing new technology. The shift I see now is increasingly to delivery uh, by the sector, by investors, uh, advocating what we need governments to do to scale up. So a real sense of momentum. If I just close with a few slides then on what Heathrow is doing, if I go to the next slide, um, statement of the obvious probably for us but we can't solve this alone so if you look at our entire carbon footprint and we follow the standard international protocols where we measure flights the whole way to their end destination not surprisingly emissions from aircraft are the majority of our emissions 95 percent um and our role there is primarily an advocacy and influencing one um a smaller percentage on the ground from surface access to and from the airport in particular, but also procurement, airport vehicles, our own buildings. Um, or, but although that's smaller, actually, we've got more influence and more control on those things. So actually, we need a plan that covers uh, the whole of that footprint uh, and sets out a way to get to net zero. So we've, we're publishing early in the new year our new net zero plan, but I'll give you a bit of a sense of where we're heading with that. On the next slide, um, we've divided our plan into net zero in the air and net zero on the ground and uh, defined four solutions to each of those. I won't spend long on this one because I've described the journey already. Uh, using less fuel, actually the one thing we can invest in as Heathrow to operate more efficiently is modernizing airspace. We're moving ahead with that for a two runway airport by 2030. Um, B is uh, improve conventional aircraft. Um, we will benefit from the ongoing uh, investment in uh, fleets by airlines. Our landing charges for newer and quieter aircraft can send a bit of a uh, signal there at the margins. But the two big steps I described are changing the fuel, advocating the policies to scale up SAF. We're also introducing a, an incentive in our landing charges to help uh, contribute in the early days to closing that price gap with kerosene that starts next year um, and uh, changing the plane. And as I said, there our role is really research at the moment to understand the potential infrastructure implications of hydrogen at Heathrow, so we're not a blocker. And then if I bring us to the ground on the next slide, um, four solutions there again. Uh, the biggest part of that 5% of our footprint on the ground is from surface access, uh, so how people get to and from the airport on the ground, uh, both passengers, colleagues, freight, uh, there are a whole host of different uh, vehicles coming to and from Heathrow. That's partly about shifting uh, people uh, providing the alternatives and incentives to get people out of cars wherever we can into trains or buses or at least sharing cars but where people are driving providing the infrastructure that enables them to use electric cars uh, huge shift underway there um, big focus on our supply chain big in normal times 70 percent of our big suppliers have set net zero targets we need to work with the others to do that and look particularly at construction materials airport vehicles small part of the footprint very visible again it's about investing in infrastructure that allows people to shift. And our building, since we, we bought fully renewable electricity for nearly five years now, the big bit of our buildings left to decarbonize is gas to heat the airport. So that will be a uh, several years of uh, investment, probably 10 to 15, to invest in an electric heating solution for Heathrow. So in, I think my final or penultimate slide um, on the next one, if you look at the relative uh, contribution of those, so what we're planning to publish early in the new year is targets to cut absolute carbon this decade. Brilliant and absolutely right to commit to net zero 2050 and set a pathway to that. We're going to have to do that. Um, but we're also very focused, we all need to be, on how we can cut carbon this decade. Um, we're just finalising the exact target levels, but this gives you a sense of the scale of reductions and where they'll come from. Um, Improved aircraft and SAF, we think, can make a big difference in the air by 2030. Uh, a smaller difference from airspace, but uh, you can see from the colour shading, we've got more control over that. So we're going to drive that very hard. Uh, and on the ground, um, a particular focus on investing in EV, electric vehicle charging infrastructure to enable that shift, uh, as well also as that investment in decarbonising heat at Heathrow. So watch this space for more detail on our plans. And then just just to close, I saw this quote from uh, 
Chris Stark earlier this year, the CEO of the Committee on Climate Change, um, on the last slide, which uh, I, I loved and it's just one I've been using a lot. The journey to zero carbon is a permanent one. Let's celebrate being the generation that will get the job done. We are firmly now in delivery phase and about delivering as quickly as we can. So I think that's just about my 15 minutes. So welcome any questions now. Matt, thank you so much. Um, very interesting and uh, <clears throat> very, very informative. Um, if you've arrived in the middle of the session, just a reminder that we are in a webinar with uh, Matt Gorman, um, Carbon Strategy Director for Heathrow Airport. Um, so your, uh, I think Matt, your, your, your presentation raised lots of questions and I've got some myself which I'm going to ask you in a minute. Um, in the audience, um, any questions you want to send, please send them through um, the chat function and um, I'll, I'll get to see them and I can ask uh, Matt um, these questions. So just uh, a polite reminder to, to state your name and your uh, organization name as you do so. Um, thank you so much. Um, so maybe Matt, first question from me. Um, I think, I mean, this is really interesting and really exciting to see that there is a, uh, a, a way forward for aviation to try to, to decarbonize. Um, but we also hear a lot of voices maybe against aviation. Um, so um, I mean, what, what do you say to um, those who think that actually we should probably just forget about aviation and use all the transport modes or maybe just not travel um, very much by plane anymore? So I suppose I come back to my starting point, which is, I think, um, genuinely, I'm not just saying this is because I'm employed by Heathrow, but I do think the world would be a poorer place in every sense of the word, poorer economically, socially, culturally, without um, the things that international travel gives us. Um, so my starting point is we should, we should protect those benefits if we can. Um, but the only way we'll do that is by getting to net zero as an aviation sector over the next, I mean, I say 30, it's now 29, nearly 28 years. You know, the clock is ticking. We have to do that. We've set out a clear pathway, UK and globally, to get there. What we now need to do is start now demonstrating delivery against that, scaling up sustainable aviation fuels. Um, plants are already open in other parts of the world. We need to start opening those in the UK. Um, introducing hydrogen uh, electric but particularly hydrogen aircraft as soon as we can the the first small aircraft likely to be this decade um, and alongside that by the way i didn't touch on this in in huge detail in my presentation but also investing in carbon removal um, we, we will almost certainly still need a bit of carbon removal in 2050 and we certainly need it in the 30 years between now and then that's got to be credible natural or engineered removal so my answer would be if we can achieve all of that, the enemy is not aviation, the enemy is carbon. If we can take the carbon out of flying and protect the benefits, that's a good thing. Um, on your, just very quickly on your point about using alternatives, we've always said that um, it, this travel should be about the right mode for the right journey. And there are lower carbon alternatives for some journeys, absolutely. So uh, within Europe, there's a pretty advanced high-speed rail network. Typically you've seen where high-speed journeys can city to city center, a three to four hours or less, people will prefer the train, all other things being equal. Um, we're not quite at that uh, speed for some city connections in the UK, uh, but where we are, we're seeing that. So Manchester to London, um, well under three hours, city to city journeys, most people will choose the train. Actually, where they are flying, Manchester to Heathrow, it's typically 70% of them to connect to another journey as, as part of our hub. So if we're, it, and to travel long haul, which is more difficult to replace. So um, I think if we want to really substitute some of those um, UK domestic journeys with rail, we need a seamless connection between air and rail. Uh, and my, my own view is the UK has not has not been as good historically at that kind of integrated approach as Paris, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, which all have high speed rail stations under the airport, allowing that seamless connection. Yes, absolutely. And maybe that, that brings us to the question of surface access, because this is one of the area where as an airport, you probably have a bit more control on carbon emissions than, than some of the other sources of emissions. Um, and uh, th there's probably some, some, some quick wins in the, fr in, in the next decade on, on surface access. Um, so what, what do you think these are um, for, for, for Heathrow Airport? Um, wh where do you see potential and what are you going to be doing? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So I think the most immediate quick win, if I start with public transport, then I'll say a bit about electric vehicles. I mean, the most immediate quick win will be the Crossrail connection into London when Crossrail fully opens. So uh, a, a rapid connection right through and under the city over to uh, to Canary Wharf and beyond. Um, so that will be significant. Um, I mean, in the next decade, we're also looking alongside rail at um, extending uh, and supporting the coach network from Heathrow. Uh, so long distance coaches for um, areas that are less well connected by uh, or less obvious to connect by rail, as well as supporting local connectivity. So um, one of the challenges of the the pandemic, which was a, had a huge impact on us and our sector, is we needed to scale back some of the financial support we provided to support things like free travel zone and subsidised bus travel for colleagues uh, coming to and from Heathrow. But we want to start reintroducing uh, some of those schemes going forward and supporting active travel as well. A significant percentage, I think it's, don't quote me on the exact stat, but I think it's up to about 50% of the many thousands of people who work at Heathrow uh, live within around five kilometers uh, of the airport. Uh, so a good distance for things like cycling, for example. So how can we make that more attractive and obvious for people? Um, as well, as I said, as investing in where passengers or colleagues are driving, investing in the kind of, EV charging infrastructure that we think people will just start to expect in future as well. Okay, thank you. Maybe moving to um, uh, sustainable aviation fuels, uh, I, I see a lot of interest from the questions we've just received. So let me just um, uh, um, read you out loud one um, from, uh, from Kate. Um, Hi Matt, uh, you said I think that by using SAF um, we can start cutting carbon from aviation today. But that doesn't seem right if the energy we're using is from waste where the carbon is currently sitting in the landfill site, but you're going to release it back into the air by burning it in an aircraft and generate some non-CO2 warming impacts in the process. So the the kind of life cycle savings from um, sustainable fuels are based on all, all of the international standards and guidance that not just the UK government, but governments around the world use to look at these things. So in waste, the equation would be um, that actually some of that uh, municipal waste uh, does emit through methane, for example, from landfill. So it is a, in life cycle terms, can be a better use uh, to um, make sustainable aviation fuel and burn it. Um, but it is really important that those, uh, the kind of life cycle savings that we're accounting for are using the most robust guidance from governments around the world. The really exciting opportunity, I'll come back on your point on non-CO2 impacts in a second, but the really exciting opportunity and when a whole host of different expert groups have studied this, the thing they're really focused on are what are called fully synthetic fuels. So the idea here is that you could, um, you'd produce hydrogen renewably using renewable electricity, combine that with carbon captured from the air, and you've got a hydrocarbon fuel, a kerosene substitute, but one that is, um, it emits when it's burned, yes, but it's already absorbed exactly the same amount of carbon from the air, so it's a carbon neutral fuel, if you like. You could even see a scenario where for every uh, bit of that fuel you produce, you're burying some carbon as well, so it even becomes uh, carbon positive rather than just carbon neutral or carbon negative, whichever way we want to look at it. Um, so th now that technology exists at a very small scale at the moment, um, so it's proven but very expensive. So the big challenge there is how we scale it up, and those kind of policies I talked about we see as critical to that. Um, but we see that from the 30s onwards being we see advanced biofuels, waste-based fuels as a transition to fully synthetic fuels. On the non-CO2 impacts, actually one of the other advantages of sustainable aviation fuels is they burn cleaner than kerosene in terms of uh, some of the particulate emissions which can contribute to these non-CO2 impacts, contrails, condensation trails in the sky, for example. Uh, we need to better quantify that benefit, but we think actually they have a benefit on non-CO2 impacts as well as CO2. Okay, well, that, that would be great because, yeah, indeed, you know, non-CO2 and contrails are also a key concern, which um, uh, it needs to be addressed. Um, and maybe just to come back on the, the question of SAFs, um, I mean, the, the volume of kerosene uh, that needs to be replaced or at least blended uh, with SAF means that um, there needs to be very large commercial 
scale production of SAP. But as far as I understand, um, a lot of um, the conversion technologies are not necessarily mature yet. And I think it's only for um, the, 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 the HEFA, um, the ethers and fatty acids, that there, there is enough um, facilities at the moment. So how, what's your plan on that? What's the plan for Hisro to get enough volume uh, of SAFs? So I think if you look at, at feedstocks, there will be a transition from heifer, as you've said, um, which is, I think, probably the majority of plants being invested in now. I don't get the detail, but our heifer. We see that transitioning to some of the other uh, waste-based technologies I've described, um, and certainly the three plants that are uh, have uh, announced they're planning to invest in the UK are all different kinds of waste-based uh, fuel. Um, and then transitioning, so that will be part of the scale up and then transitioning to uh, fully synthetic fuels. Um, so our view is that we need, some of the policy support needs to be tailored to some of that new first of a kind technology. And I described the mix of a mandate uh, and we think probably actually a sub mandate for things like synthetic fuels. So you're driving a particular uh, focus there alongside the tax based price incentives and also capital support. And the government's talked about capital support for some of those uh, more emerging technologies. So to help those first of a kind plants open. Um, so we think the other thing I would say, and this is partly a response to Kate's question, is you know any as well as the life cycle savings, these fuels need to meet the strictest um, sustainability standards as well. Um, we can't be in a position where um, it, you know we somewhere in the supply chain for these sustainable fuels there are land use or biodiversity concerns. Um, and actually, the UN our ICAO last week um, for Corsia. Uh, the carbon trading scheme for aviation launched a, a strict set of sustainability standards. Um, the and the uh, we're focused on bodies like the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterial, ensuring that aviation feedstock is sustainable. That's critical. Yeah. Okay. And uh, a question um, uh, from from Paul. Um, so to produce stuff and also later on um, synthetic um, kerosene like hydrogen, etc., these will require a substantial amount of uh, sustainable electricity. Um, mm. So wh where do you source it? And, and shall we expect Heathrow Airport to become an energy provider as well as an infrastructure provider in the future? Uh, a really good question. Um, I mean, I suppose, so if I answer a kind of macro and then at a Heathrow level, I mean, at an overall level, yes, we see the transition to net zero for the UK economy and, and globally being a transition to more electricity need for different things, including hydrogen production. Um, and there's a, I suppose, part of the UK government's overall plan is how do we provide that uh, electricity through renewables, but also the announcement last week of uh, support for small modular reactors, nuclear reactors, which the government sees as part of the plan. So I think we need to solve that at a global and national level, the demand for electricity. Um, you're right, it will take electricity to produce hydrogen. We're just beginning to look at the potential for Heathrow here. I mean, at the moment, we, um, we don't produce fuel at Heathrow, it arrives in pipelines. Yeah. We have connections to the grid for our own energy needs. Uh, you can certainly see in future how uh, some of the increased demand for electricity we could meet from the grid, things like electric heating or vehicles, but certainly when you start to get into the potential to be producing hydrogen at Heathrow, uh, which is one option that could be a significantly greater demand. The short answer at the moment is we don't have a clear view on what that looks like. We're just in the early days of beginning to explore, but um, could there be a scenario where we, we want to uh, produce some of that hydrogen at Heathrow, possibly. We'll certainly need to liquefy imported gas hydrogen at Heathrow, so there will be a need for more electricity, yes. Okay. And maybe moving to um, the, the, the financial impacts of um, such investments, um, I, I see a question from my, from um, uh, Bool asking about the, um, the monetary um, aspects in terms of cost benefits. Um, mm. um, and I guess um, the, the size of investment that you have to make as an airport is significant. Uh, but on the other hand, you're not necessarily so sure of the demand from airlines because, um, as you said in your presentation, why would airline um, uh, buy um, fuel which is two or four times, two to four times more expensive mm -hmm. than what they can get currently? So, how do you address this um, uh, very important investment risk? So, again, let me take that a couple of levels. I mean, I think you're right, there will be. 
uh, invest, we will need as Heathrow Airport to invest in some of our own infrastructure to do some of the things I've described, EV charging, electric heating. We're a regulated, bit economically regulated. Uh, so every uh, five years, we go through a process with the Civil Aviation Authority and uh, discussion with it, our airline customers on our plans to invest over the next five years. We're just in the middle of that process at the moment and have put forward plans to invest over the next five years up to £180 million in decarbonizing Heathrow through some of the things I've described. Um, ultimately, uh, the CAA will reach a view not just on carbon, but our overall plans for capital investment. Uh, but we're making a strong case that it's the right thing to do for consumers in future uh, to protect affordable travel. We need to invest uh, is the right thing to do for the environment uh, and to meet some of the regulations we're going to face. I mean, at a broader level on uh, demand risk, our conclusion is that um, and from a host of work we've done historically that um, people are willing to pay a bit more for travel um, uh, because of the the benefits they get from it and we've always supported the polluter pays principle so uh, aviation does have external costs we should pay those carbon costs um, we think uh, those costs can be accommodated uh, without a, a fundamental impact on demand from the airport but that's clearly something that we um, will be, it's become core to our business now to understand future carbon pricing and potential impacts on demand uh, and ensure um, that uh, we, we fully understand those. But I go back to the point earlier that we, so our goal is we think we and airlines provide a valuable service to society, something people want. We'll only carry on delivering that if we can get to zero carbon. That's at, or net zero. That's the clear journey we're on, um, and that's our real focus: is scaling up the solutions that we know exist at speed, so we can protect the benefits. Okay, and maybe a, a question um, from Stefan. Um, I think we see that in Europe there is a direction to um, maybe to impose a staff mandate so that airlines have to um, uh, to use uh, much more sustainable um, sources of energy. Uh, do you see the UK taking the same direction? And also, um, how about um, what the US is planning to do? Because I guess as an international airport, you really need to be um, looking in all directions. Yeah, I mean, I think, yes, Europe is moving towards a mandate um, of, I think, 5% by 2030, but then rising quite significantly after that. Uh, the US hasn't favoured mandates. It's gone entirely for a kind of tax-based incentive model, what I referred to earlier as the blender's credit, which goes a long way to closing the price gap with, with kerosene. Um, what the UK has consulted on a mandate and is planning to introduce one, but... Um, the case we're making to the government is a mandate alone won't scale up SAF unless you've got some kind of price incentive as well. And we think the UK could chart a bit of a middle ground between the kind of European and, and US models, which can attract investment and make us a good place to invest. Um, but I think we need that government action quickly is the case we're making, because the risk otherwise is that global capital flows to you know the US, as is happening, to Europe. We need it also to come to the UK. Okay, and um, maybe another question um, for, from Mark from Steer. Um, is there a risk for Heathrow Airport to be a leader in achieving net zero carbon? I mean, of course, you know, it is good and absolutely necessary to do so, but um, there are no international international standards yet. Uh, we don't really know what hydrogen powered aircraft are going to look like in terms of operation and, uh, you know, changes to the airport ecosystem. Um, many technologies also require investments, but they haven't yet reached their, reached their technology readiness levels. Um, so how do you mitigate this? Is there a first mover risk? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I mean, I'm struggling a bit, I suppose, with the idea of first mover, because if I look around the world at other leading airports and indeed the aviation sector, in a sense, we are looking to move as a group on this. So um, I talked about the UK aviation sector setting out our plan to net zero uh, and the things that that involves. Our global aviation sustainability group, ATAG, the Air Transport Action Group, has set out a similar plan globally. Um, and we're all trying to drive at that net zero uh, goal. I mean, I guess um, if Heathrow was 
so let's take hydrogen as an example. You could see risks there if we were uh, investing a significant amount in infrastructure for hydrogen aircraft um, that became some of that technology became obsolete, for example, or got superseded. There's a potential risk there, but I don't think we're not at that stage yet. And I think we are um, we're looking to work with others in the sector so that we develop common standards and approaches so that the because hydrogen um, hydrogen aircraft only work if you've got hydrogen at both ends of the route. You can't, if you can fill up at Heathrow, but not at your destination airport, that's not ideal. So we'll need to work with others, I guess, and move um, move collectively. So I'm not sure if that quite answers the question, but I suppose I don't, we're absolutely looking to take a lead, but not, not to the extent of um, kind of creating uh, significant risk in the way that was described, I don't think. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe staying on the topic of hydrogen, I see a question here from um, John Carr from um, Carr UK, who asks about um, the safety implications of hydrogen-powered aircraft um, and also on, on the development timescale of um, these aircraft. So, I mean, the timescale, so the first thing says we're not, as you would expect, the, the kind of the real experts in um, aircraft design, including the safety implications of, of different aircraft. We, what we are looking to do is to get the best sense from big manufacturers like Airbus, from some of the startups like Zero Avia in this space of likely timescales. Airbus 2035 for the, the kind of range I described, short haul flights in Europe. Um, Zero Avia is talking of 70 to 80 seaters. Uh, potentially doing up to 500 nautical miles um, by uh, the second half of this decade. So you can see these these aircraft um, potentially starting to arrive. And so we need to think, well, how would we plan to respond? On the safety implications, I mean, from, from an airport perspective, we uh, secured funding from the Innovate UK, the Future Flight Fund, to begin to understand the implications for the airport, and that includes looking at the potential uh, safety considerations for hydrogen. Um, we're, we bid for a next phase of funding to further develop that understanding. I suppose um, from from the early work that I've we've done, I haven't heard anything that I would describe as insurmountable, and I'm not an expert in hydrogen, but clearly there are considerations that we as an airport would need to work through. So. Okay, and maybe um, a question um, from me on um, airspace modernization, because you mentioned that's one element, and uh, so I think I'd like to, to know a bit more what you have in mind for that. Um, and, and does it include, for instance, things like the, the recent Airbus trial of um, two HP-50s flying in a, in a bird-like formation, for instance? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that, that will help? So, I mean, our big focus is the, the kind of basic structure of airspace, both in the UK and around the world. I mean, it um, was designed in most cases 50, 60, 70 years ago uh, in an era of different navigation technology, kind of ground based radio beacons rather than satellite navigation. Uh, it's perfectly safe, but it's not very efficient and it needs to be modernized everywhere to take advantage of some of the new technology that exists. Um, we and we think it could deliver i mean the figures vary uh, around the world but anywhere between a kind of let's say a five to a ten percent efficiency improvement so it's not insignificant um the bit we can um most influence at heathrow is airspace up to seven thousand feet so we're responsible as the airport for investing to modernize that and connecting with the upper level airspace that nats in the uk is modernizing we're pushing ahead with doing that by 2030 um it's been historically it's been quite a slow process i think partly because um it get it can get politically challenging people have got used to how planes currently fly in the sky and where they fly airspace modernization could change some of that um, but it clearly offers significant carbon benefits. We need to do it in the right way. Look at how we um, take advantage of things that can reduce noise, you know, more continuous descents and climbs from the airport, how we can vary flight paths to offer predictable respite, which is one of the big things that people want from noise, just breaks, predictable breaks from noise. But we have to push ahead, push ahead and modernize. The formation flying, I'm not close to, to be honest, in terms of um, it, it looks like it could offer some benefits. Is it a big focus for widespread rollout? I'm not sure, to be honest, not close enough to that. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one question from um, Mike Gogin from Steer. Um, 
Matt, you noted that the sector-wide agreement to tackle net zero perhaps unique in scale. Behind this coalition sits a highly competitive and in places regulated sector. Uh, Mike was wondering how the forces of competition and regulation will play out and can be made to play a part to achieve the net zero pathway. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. And I suppose um, they do play a role. I mean, some, a group like Sustainable Aviation is, um, we say among ourselves, and I think rightly that actually this is a this is such a significant for, issue for all of us that we need to collaborate, um, and we do on publications like the Net Zero Pathway and and plans to get there. Um, but I suppose that inevitably there's a degree of competition. You can see this as this issue becomes more significant for um, consumers as well. You can see uh, you can already see airlines beginning to. Um, kind of position their approach on sustainability um, and look to make that more attractive to uh, to consumers. I don't think we're yet at the stage with um, airports, particularly where um, consumers are choosing airports, particularly on their approach to sustainability. It's a it may be a factor, but you know availability of flights to the right place at the right cost are more significant, uh, and ease of access to the airport. But for us as well, we we see it as part of our overall. Uh, brand positioning in future, certainly. So it's, um, yeah, I think there will be some increased competition, but still a strong focus on collaboration. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to take one last question um, um, from um, Alex Roy from um, Manchester Airport Group, who's asking about um, frequent flyer levies, which have become politically quite popular in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and um, so Alex was wondering what the view of history is on, on this as, as a measure to control carbon and whether or not you believe that they would be effective. So a number of things on this. I mean, the first thing is we support the polluters pays principle. People should pay their carbon costs. I said that earlier, but there are uh, better and less good ways of paying those carbon costs. The frequent fly level actually start as a proposal starts from a point that there is no solution. There's no technological solution to ABS. The only way is to manage demand down um, to cut carbon and therefore it seeks to kind of start it, it impose a ratcheting price. So the more you fly, the more you pay with with a sole objective of ratcheting down demand. We take a different view that actually there are technological solutions. Uh, we sh people should absolutely pay carbon costs, but we think that those costs should should help support and drive some of the technologies to decarbonise aviation. So to give an example, um, uh, during this decade, uh, airlines in the UK will start paying the uh, auction costs of their UK emissions trading permits, for example. Um, we think that the hundreds of millions that will be raised through that uh, each year could and should be used to um, fund the kind of price support mechanism I described to get sustainable uh, fuel investment uh, flowing. So we think, and by the way, those auction costs would fall on airlines and ultimately we think consumers. Um, so, uh, but that's a different kind of model. It's not saying hit people with a big price tag to stop them flying. It's saying, yes, pay your carbon costs, but use that revenue to scale up solutions. Um, I mean, the other thing I'd say is you, you look at air passenger duty. It's the um, one of the, I don't know if it's still the highest tax on aviation in the world, but it's certainly up there. Um, originally introduced as an environmental tax, uh, has been raised several times since whenever it was introduced in the 90s. Um, and yet hasn't had any noticeable impact on demand because aviation demand has increased significantly over that period as well. So I think that kind of goes back to my point that people value flying, they're willing to pay more for it. But our argument is let's therefore use that, the costs people are paying cleverly to drive the solutions. Okay, well, thank you very much, Matt. Um, very, very interesting to hear from you today. Um, and thank you for taking all these questions from the audience and um, thank you for sending them. Um, so we, 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 we wish you really um, the very best um, in achieving your objective. I think we all want uh, to see you succeed and we, it, it's very much um, necessary. Um, so this is the end of our um, webinar series today on um, aviation delivering net zero. 
but there are two other sessions um, tomorrow and Friday at the same time if you want to um, listen to these. So tomorrow's session is focused on zero emission mobility with um, a panel from InstaVault and Kent County Council. And then on Friday, we are uh, looking at um, raising green finance with uh, Penny Latore from Ensphere and Hayden Morgan from Morgan Green Advisory.